Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, getting a little late start. We had some technical issues, but I am Susan Bird. I'm an inspector for noxious weed control for Yakima County. I've been with Yakima County. That'll be 20 years in April. And part of my job is to do the outreach and um, communicate and educate the public for the plants of concern in Yakima County and um, statewide. So I really appreciate being invited to speak with you guys up there in Ponderay County. I wish I could be there in person. But our topic is going to be toxic plants. And um, to me, educating people about the toxic plants is as important, if not more important than the noxious weeds. Just because it's on our list uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily toxic. And so getting people to know what's out there naturally, native, as well as invasive, and making sure you know what's in your pastures or your fields to me is as important as, as enforcing on weeds that are invasive. So with that, please note that toxic does not always mean deadly. Dose determines if the plant is a source of nutrients or a toxic hazard. So sometimes a little nibble isn't gonna be a, a problem, but if it's something that's mixed in their feed where they get more than a nibble or they don't have an option, then it can become a problem. So just because the plant could have some toxic properties doesn't mean that your animal should absolutely not eat it, but it's always good to know what that dose would be. So if a few ounces isn't a problem, but a, a pound or more is, we need to know that. So the plants that I'm gonna go over today are all concerns. They're all hazards that you don't want in your fields, in your roadsides, exposing your pets, your kids, or your animals, livestock to. Oh no, you guys still have this, I hope. I don't know what I did. Okay, bear with me. When in doubt, um, when you're growing something in your pastures, if you have your animals exposed to something on rangeland, if you doubt its toxicity, find out or take it out. What's in your pastures, what's in your lawns? If it's harmful, figure it out. And if it's in a pasture that you can control, if in doubt, pull it out or keep your animals out until you know what you have. Some toxic plants are very pretty. Some of them are escaped ornamentals. Some of them are often ornamentals in our yards. Um, and if we don't know what they are and your animals get into your yard or into your flower bed, it could become a problem. So walk your properties, um, know what you have and I'm trying to move this out of the way, um, whether or not your animals should eat it. So in, in this picture, blue larkspur is a native. Buttercup is a native, Meadow Death Camas is a native, and all three of those are highly toxic to grazing animals. So Creeping Buttercup, of all buttercups are toxic. Um, this one just seems to be really high in toxins, and it seems to cause the most problems in Eastern Washington. The sheep are the most susceptible, but all grazing animals can be affected by it. The to toxins are a gly glycoside, um, ranunculins, which are, um, they make them photosensitive, they affect the liver and the kidneys, um, they cause gastric issues. It's just a horrible plant to have grazing animals exposed to. Uh, one flower can have a thousand tiny, tiny little seeds, and they are really common in wetlands, um, along irrigation canals, and in irrigated pastures. So it's toxic in all stages of growth. The heat seeds can be viable and found in hay for many, many years. Animals are more likely to eat this if they don't have anything else. However, I have been on um, some field walks where the animals had plenty of other food, but grazing animals nibble. And so if you have any of the buttercup families, you wanna just keep it away from your grazing animals and your livestock. This one is Meadow Death um, is, It is in the onion family. It is widespread throughout Eastern Washington. It's one of the first flowers to green up, but it will bloom all summer long. Um, it starts in early spring and usually, I usually finish seeing it bloom July, first part of August. But if we get a rainfall or something later in the season, it'll go ahead and push up and bloom again. Um, 
It is a neurotoxic alkaloid. One bite of this will cause death to a large animal. It's um, easily confused with the native camas, the blue camas, when they're not blooming. And so I know in the Yakima area, uh, natives will actually go out and weed out the meadow death camas when it's blooming so that it's not affecting the camas fields. Uh, it's just a, a good plant to be aware of. The, the papery um, lining or skin is very, very dark brown or black, and the blades of it are very grass-like. And so if it's not blooming, it's difficult to tell if this is a meadow death camas or not. However, honeybees, if they feed on this, probably won't make it back to their nest. It is a highly toxic plant. This is another native. We have lupins and larkspurs throughout Eastern Washington, especially at the higher elevations. It's very common in people's flower beds as an ornamental. It causes crooked calf syndrome. It causes fetal damage and abortion in animals that are pregnant. Um, labored breathing, incoordination, staggers, this is a plant that, uh, again, animals will avoid, but when it's growing in a lot of grass or in a lush area, the accidental bites are gonna be the problem. So any of the oxalis family, lupins, um, they're all highly toxic to grazing animals. So this is a delphinium. Um, the flowers are, are gonna open up into a column sim similar to a lupin. It has, uh, water loving tendencies, irrigation, creek beds, um, drainage areas that get a little more moisture. We went on a um, pasture walk a few years ago where a gentleman lost seven yearling steers in about a week and a half's time. And they were feeding good hay and they had adequate pasture, but this was growing throughout the creek bed in the bottom of the pasture. And we could see where they had nibbled and, and grazed on the delphinium throughout the creek bed. Even though they weren't you know, forced to eat it, they did nibble and that caused problems. So be aware of the natives that are toxic as well as the invasives. So even though you feed good food, Grazing animals are browsers and they will nibble randomly on whatever they're exposed to. So be aware and just um, keep an idea of what they're, what they're grazing on. They're often affected accidentally by exposure. Plants growing in pasture areas, um, if they're nibbling or if it's harvested into food like hay or, or silage, they're more likely to consume it. As you can see in this picture, the cows in the background, there's a lot of hound's tongue um, growing in that field. And they're probably not going to intentionally eat it. Hound's tongue has a little bit of a smell to it they don't care for. But if they're up there grazing on that deep grass, they're very likely to get an accidental bite. And so hound's tongue has an alkaloid toxin, which is an accumulative. It causes liver failure over a period of time. We have found hound's tongue throughout areas across Washington state. And so the key now is to educate and aware. Um, we will probably never eradicate it. It can take up to 18 months from an animal consuming a lethal dose to when they may die or have symptoms of, of toxicity. Um, some signs of death occur. Horses, sheep, and, and llamas seem to have a wasting appearance. Uh, cattle, they don't really give you a lot of clues. Um, I did go on a, on a field investigation where 90% of a lamb crop was lost. Uh, the, the fetuses were petrified and we sent it to WSU and talked to them and it was a hound's tongue poisoning situation. And so be aware, um, if you have hound's tongue, if you're finding these little tick shaped seeds that stick to everything, when they're dry, they're kind of grayish in appearance. Um, hound's tongue is highly toxic. And as you can see in this top picture, um, the animals have grazed around it a lot, and then the hound's tongue came in after they got a little fall moisture. So they tend to avoid it, but they do get accidental poisonings. Um, it does reproduce by that Velcro-covered seed, and that's the only way it spreads. It's not going to spread in the wind. Something has to pick it up and carry it, and um, it's going to hitchhike. Some people call it the gypsy plant or gypsy flower because it hitches a ride. And wherever that seed drops off or gets knocked off is where you find new hound's tongue plants. So this next one is common groundsel and it's on the noxious weed list. Um, I think it's a C. It's very, very widespread throughout croplands in Eastern Washington, especially orchards. 
it is highly toxic at all stages of the plant, all stages of growth. So if it gets cut and put into feed sources, that's when your toxins are gonna be the biggest problem. Um, this plant will go to seed the minute it is stressed. So those little yellow, tiny yellow flowers, the minute you spray it or cut it, it turns into these little puff balls of seeds, taking all the nutrients out of that plant and putting it into seed before it dies. And so it's windborne, the seeds float, it's waterborne, um, it moves with animals that walk through it, the little seeds will stick into their fur. And so we try to make sure that groundsel isn't growing in crop or pasture areas where it could be a concern. And as you can see, the lower left-hand picture, it's growing along a field that was recently green chopped and they chopped in, they missed an entire row next to the road because they were finding it along the edges of the field. Um, unfortunately, they didn't know to check the rest of the field for this. Several years ago, about 125 dairy animals died from groundsel poisoning because it was in their feed. And they, animals, if they're feeding strictly hay or, or chopped product, the animals can't pick through that. So groundsel is one to make sure we we keep out of ruminants and horses. Sheep and goats seem to be kind of resistant to it, but why push it, right? Why, why take that chance? This next one is yellow star thistle. Injury to muzzles of cattle. Sheep are pretty much resistant to it, but it's deadly to horses. The only place yellow star thistle has thorns is around the base of the flower and they grow where the bracts of the plant flower is. Um, the stems have flags that go up the stem, so they're not a round stem. They have an obvious little ridge around each side of the stem. And in the dry season, if you're looking for areas where yellow star was or might come back, look for those little cotton balls on a stick. These little, um, let's see if I can get the pointer to work. Um, these little white puffs of, the, they lose their thorns a lot of times. There'll be a few thorns that'll stick to it. But in the late fall or winter, when you're looking to see if there's a yellow star population or very early spring, you'll see these little white fluffs on the ends of the sticks and that will tell you where the yellow star populations are gonna be. Yellow star causes chewing disease in horses and it's an addictive toxin that once they get it, they search for it. Um, it's an accumulative toxin so it builds up in their system. And once you start seeing symptoms that the animal can't swallow, it's too late. There is no treatment for it, so they have to be put down. It's a horrible, horrible plant. Uh, Russian knapweed um, is very widespread throughout irrigated farmland in Eastern Washington. And it is as toxic, if not more toxic than the yellow star with the same chemical compounds. So it will cause chewing disease faster in horses than yellow star thistle does. The roots of Russian knapweed are rhizome, and so they spread by root as well as by seed. Um, one stem can produce thousands of seeds, but it also produces underground runners. So if you go in and break those runners up and disc it, you're creating more and more plants. Russian knapweed and yellow star are allelopathic, so they change the soil chemistry, so nothing else likes to grow around it, which makes it where it has no competition and nothing else likes to grow, so it gets all the water and all the nutrients and it does very, very well and forms very dense colonies of Russian knapweed or yellow star thistle as it was. Um, Russian knapweed has a latex type sap. It has a dark brown to blackish root system. And so you can identify it by that. It looks similar to yellow star when it starts to grow as a rosette, but it doesn't have the flags on the stems. It has a very round stem as it grows up. So it's another one you wanna make sure horses are not exposed to. And um, cattle can eat it. They tend to avoid it. If you force them to eat it, they'll eat it. But it, it's been researched and it, it is a high protein at the right stages, but the the, toxins and the hazards don't outweigh the viability of it being a food source. Hemp dogbane or creeping dogbane is a native plant. It um, was called hemp by some of the, the native populations. Bitterroot is another name for it. All parts of this plant are highly toxic and it's toxic even when it's dry. 
And so even though it's a native plant, we recommend that if it's growing where livestock is grazing, that you remove the plant or fence the livestock off of it. Um, the tribal used to use it for um, bark, uh, rope, and baskets. They called it Indian psychic or American hemp. It was um, used for some medicinal purposes as well, but it's not a good plant to have growing where you have livestock and, um, and animals that could be affected by it. So this next one is the second most deadly plant in North America. Uh, poison hemlock is second only to water hemlock in its toxicity levels. You do not want to handle this plant uh, without protective coverings, um, gloves that are chemical resistant. Um, you want to make sure you're wearing long sleeves, long pants. When you're working around this plant, you can inhale the vapors. It can cause you to be sick if it's hot. Um, poison hemlock is in the carrot family. The leaves look like carrot when they're little in the rosette stage. And as it grows up more, it has a carrot-like leaf and a dill-like flower. Um, poison hemlock is toxic in all stages. So if you are mowing or doing something in this where the plants dry or they're sprayed, animals are more likely to get accidental poisoning from this plant once it's chopped because it'll be spread around in other food sources possibly. Or if it's sprayed, a lot of our herbicides have salts in them that attract animals to them. So if you are dealing with poison hemlock, make sure that even though it's going to kill the plant, you need to remove it from access to any animals or children that could be playing with it. Um, there have been multiple deaths and um, unfortunately some child reactions to the flowers. And we've seen a lot of stuff where people think it's wild parsley or just a wild flower and they don't think anything of it. And it's very, very toxic. Um, if you are exposed to it, you will get disoriented, um, headaches, dizziness, upset stomach, nausea. One bite of a residual of this is enough to kill a cow. And so if you were to slice this with a pocket knife, or do something with your pocket knife and then later slice an apple, the residual on the pocket knife is enough to cause that apple to be deadly. So be aware of what you're working in, what you have growing around you. Um, we see poison hemlock a lot on roadsides and riverbanks. And if that roadside is mowed, it's okay. But if the clippings of that mowing gets thrown by the mower into a pasture, it's likely to cause problems. So we wanna make sure we know the surroundings of what this plant is, is located. And when you're working around it, if you are mowing, make sure you wear a dust mask, make sure you're wearing protective clothing, long sleeves, um, gloves, make sure your skin is covered and that you're not inhaling the dust from this plant. So this one is water hemlock. It is the most deadly plant in North America. It is native. And so water hemlock is found mostly along creeks and rivers and ponds, um, irrigation ditches where the water is allowing the, the soil in the vicinity to be pretty wet. But it will go dormant for years if that water is taken away. And when water is brought back, it will be reintroduced and it'll come out of dormancy and go ahead and grow. And so if you are working in an area that you see these beautiful white flowers and they look like a wild celery, um, the plants are kind of ridged. Uh, they're not as defined of a ridge of celery, but as you can see, they grow kind of cupped around each other like a celery does. And it very closely resembles celery in its growth habitat. Um, the pockets in the roots are the biggest key as to whether or not you have water hemlock. This is another one that you don't want to handle without some sort of protective glove. These are rubberized gloves. Um, don't handle it bare skin. Don't think you're just going to pull it out of the water and, and go deal with it. When you cut into the roots, the young plants um, don't have real defined pockets, but it's real fibrous, so you should be able to see it. The older the plant gets, the bigger these pockets become, and they'll have a viscous yellowish colored fluid. And that is the highest, most toxic part of the plant. The entire plant is toxic, even when it's dry. Um, what you want to be cautious of, though, is the water that these plants are growing around and in. If an animal's grazing along that and the roots get crushed, the water will become toxic. 
So if there's a high flow of water, that dilutes the toxin fairly quickly. But if it's in a settling pond or a very slow moving area, that water can be toxic for a long time. So you want to make sure that animals don't have access to that water if you're trying to remove the plant, dig it out, if you're doing something that would cause those roots to get crushed in the process. So this one is another native plant to Central America. Um, the sacred detura, jimson weed, they're all the same family and they have the same toxins. And there's several varieties. There are a lot of ornamental varieties and they have a um, psychoactive toxin in these. So if animals eat them, you'll see them head pressing. You'll see them kind of stumbling. Um, it's not an animal that, it's not a, a plant that animals will typically eat willingly. But if, again, accidental doses um, can be a problem. As you can see, these plants are growing where a cornfield was. Um, these are growing along somebody's flower bed. If a child picks one of those trumpet-like flowers and blows through it and acts like it's a trumpet, the child could become very, very sick or even die. So we recommend that you don't have these growing um, where children will play. They're a pretty plant, but they're a very dangerous plant. They cause delirium hallucinations, psychosis. If you take them internally, it can be deadly. The seeds are the most deadly part of this plant. However, the entire plant is toxic, even when it's dry. So if it gets chopped into feed, if somebody's playing with it, with these little pods, they're very thorny, um, but the entire plant is hazardous and it's not a good plant to have growing where kids or stock are. So everyone in Eastern Washington is probably familiar with kochia. It was brought here as a food source from Europe. However, when kochia is stressed, it becomes toxic and it is the most toxic when it's mature. And if it is drought stressed or frost stressed, it becomes an issue with alkaloids, nitrates, and oxalates. So it's not really a good plant that's a feasible feed crop in Eastern Washington. They do still bale it in some of the Dakotas, but they monitor it, they test it for nitrates. They don't use it as a feed source if it's had any stress. So kochia is one of those plants, it changes the soil. So it becomes allelopathic. It makes it where nothing else likes to grow around it. It does very, very well in disturbed areas. Um, abnormal weather will affect its toxin levels. It causes pho photosensitivity, causes weight loss, causes increased water intake. Um, there's a lot of symptoms for this. Um, it is also naturally glyphosate resistant, and it is also naturally um, tri triclopyr resistant, I think. Um, so there's a couple herbicides that don't work on it, and it kind of smiles and waves at you and says, hey, look, you, you missed me. So kochia is one to be aware of. Pigweed or red root pigweed, the amaranth family, um, is toxic to all grazing animals. It's toxic in all parts of the plant and it's especially toxic in hay. And so once you've stressed it or cut it, uh, red root pigweed is um, not, a, not a good one to be feeding your livestock. I think pigs are the only thing that can eat it and I would really, really restrict what they can eat on that. So mustards, all types of mustards are toxic to all grazing animals. However, dose determines toxicity. So what you want to do is make sure that they have adequate food so that they will avoid the mustards if at all possible. Um, horses are the most affected by it. You can start getting um, problems with joints in fetuses that can cause abortions, um, prolonged gestation, aimless wandering, it causes lots and lots of problems, and there's a lot of varieties of mustards. Some of them are, invent, are introduced, some of them are native. Um, so just be aware that mustards are a problem, and just because you have this big field of green plants doesn't mean you have adequate food for whatever you're trying to graze um, or feed. St. John's wort um, is an introduced escaped ornamental. It's taking over some of our forests in eastern Washington. It is very toxic in the spring growth. And St. John's wort, you can tell if it is a St. John's wort by the little tiny spots. And if you hold it up to the light, the light will shine through all those little dots and it looks like they're transparent. Um, as you can see, it um, causes photosensitivity, 
It's very toxic if it's baled and hay animals are more likely to eat it. So it's another one of those plants that was introduced on purpose. Um, however, it's not a good one to have where your livestock or pets can be playing in it. Um, I've seen where it has lesion, causes lesions on the udders on nursing animals. The skin will actually slough if they're exposed to sunlight. Um, it has some, um, Iparacin is the toxin, and there's a couple others as well. So it's a it's a beautiful flower. It's an escaped ornamental. It's taking over eastern Washington in some of the some of the rangelands, um, but it's definitely something you want to prevent from getting into your hay or your pastures. Um, the local weed, milk vetch family. Um, again, you want to be very cautious. Vetch is a very common um, cover crop. And so what you don't wanna do is use vetch as a cover crop and then put it into your hay. Uh, it causes excessive wandering, salivation, um, lack of coordination, ongoing weight loss, lots of, lots of problems with their vision. Uh, it's just not a good plant to have with grazing animals at all. It's very common in Eastern Washington though, especially in some of the rangelands. This one is tansy ragwort. And we used to think this was primarily a west side plant, that it needed more water than we had in the central Washington area. Um, I know some of the northern Washington stuff gets a little more water than we do. And we've seen it documented in Idaho, in some of the mountainous areas of Montana. And now we're finding it throughout some of the upper elevations of eastern Washington, central Washington, Yakima area. Um, it's a pretty plant. It was an escaped ornamental. It can take months for symptoms of exposure to this plant to develop. And so it's not something that if they graze through it right now, you're going to see the symptoms in a day or two. A lot of times you won't see symptoms of toxicity from the ragwort family or the tansy family for several months. And then you'll start seeing loss of vision, lack of appetite. They'll start pressing their head against the post or a tree. It's still toxic when it's dry. Um, flowers are the most toxic part. Honey from these flowers can be tainted with these um, toxins and the alkaloids can become an issue in honey. Milk from animals that have grazed on this can be toxic with alkaloids. Uh, there's numerous paralyzidine alkaloids and as little as 3% of the body weight of this plant can be a lethal dose. So some people say, well, if they eat 3%, but if they're grazing through something, they might eat 3% pretty easily. Or if it's baled into their hay, it can accumulate very, very quickly as well. And so it's not, it's not a plant to mess with. So this is by no means a complete list of toxic plants. Uh, there are so many out there and dose determines toxicity. If you don't know what you have or what the animals are exposed to, definitely have someone come do a field survey, get to know what you have in your fields, know what's around you. If you're a hiker, pay attention to where you're hiking, especially if you're going to the mountains with horses, um, know where your animals are picketed and what they're exposed to. And um, with that, I'm gonna say thank you for your time. I know we were running a little late. And so if there's any questions, um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, most of the weed boards throughout this county are there to help. So if you have uh, questions for the Ponderay County Weed Board and the State Noxious Weed Board and WSU are great uh, resources as well. And that's all I've got. Great, thank you. Um, we do have some time for questions. If anybody has any, we'll start in the room here. Uh, if anybody has any online, they can put it in the Q&A and Sue could probably actually um, answer online sure. after we're done yeah. here, so. All right, any questions? All right, the bathroom. I'm getting ready to the microphone. And so here, hopefully. I was not able to hear that question. 
I wonder if it has to be spoken in here. Is there a book you would recommend? Uh, um, topic? As far as for toxic plants, the State Weed Board has a nice little one, um, which actually the picture that I have in the first slide of the two horses is the cover picture for that. It is a really good resource because it's pretty broad. Um, WSU has a couple books put out that they recommend of um, toxic plants. Really, the internet is a great resource. Um, I use, um, and unfortunately it's out of print, it's called Toxic Toxic Plants and You, I think, and don't quote me on that because I don't remember exactly. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet and at some of the state extension websites for toxic plants. And I would go to the WSU Extension website and see what they recommend on that. Okay. The book I have, I've had forever, so I don't remember the title of it. All right, sounds good. Anybody else have any questions in the room here? All right, okay, I think we're good. Um, okay. So for those online who kind of, we did our announcements a little bit before nine, so I just wanna remind everybody online that they need to answer the polls, the poll questions uh, throughout the day. Uh, if especially if you are doing the pesticide credits. Um, and if you haven't already chatted me your uh, name and license number for the pesticide credits as well. And I am going to launch a couple of polls here since we have a few minutes while we get Loretta's presentation ready because I forgot to launch the morning poll. So, so I have a, another comment if I'm still able to, um, a lot of people don't realize that trees can be toxic as well. And I didn't include any tree stuff in here, but if you have plants like boxwood that are being pruned, um, the, the leaves of a boxwood are highly toxic. The leaves of, of cherry and walnut can be highly toxic. And also we're finding high toxic levels of the tree of heaven tree that's being surveyed right now so widely. Um, has a cardiac effect on animals. So if they're grazing or browsing on trees, that can cause issues as well. Um, so we have another question online. Okay. Sure. Um, says, I'm, wait I'm wanting to grow some wildflowers in my meadow. Is this, safe? Is this a safe thing to do? I'm looking at poppies in particular. Um, if you have grazing livestock, I would say no. Um, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. If you have, we're going to say the wildflower seed packet that the State Noxious Weed Board put out, um, it has lupin and larkspurs. It has some plants that have the higher oxalates in it. So if, if it's a meadow that's just a meadow and you don't have grazing livestock in it, it's probably okay. Um, wildflower packets from other parts of the country are very likely to have noxious weeds that we don't want in Washington state. And because you're seeding a meadow where you don't have good control over what does and doesn't go to seed, that could become an issue in itself. I definitely agree with the seed packets containing noxious weeds. You need to be very careful when you're um, purchasing seed of any kind, read the back. It'll tell you how much weed percentage they have in them. So just as a caution, I'd be always checking anything that you buy as a seed. Well, not only that, but the, the weed percentage when they say that is really determined by where they're produced. So in Texas, they have plants that are not considered a weed that they could be considered a weed in Washington state. And so depending on where that seed was produced as to whether or not they'll even label it as a weed, but be cautious because in places like Ohio, velvet leaf is no longer a noxious weed because it has taken over their state. Their potential to have a velvet leaf seed in a wildflower seed packet is pretty high. And then the seeds of velvet leaf are viable for over 50 years one flower can have hundreds of seeds. So even if there's just one seed in that wildland pick that you bought from the Midwest, 
it could become a really big issue here. So if you can locally source your seed or get it through the, the state weed board has um, weed free seed that you can get through most of the weed boards, I would recommend that that would be your source. Um, and then there's the Washington Native um, Plant Society can get you seeds as well. Uh, that's another one though that you need to be cautious because water hemlock seed is sold as a native water flower. We don't want you planting water hemlock in your water garden. Uh, that'd, that'd just be a bad idea. So be cautious even when you're ordering from native seed societies that what you're getting is something you really want to have on your property. We have another question online. Um, what safe plants are protective to prevent wildfires around structures? Okay, um, you want plants that are low growing and that will stay green longer. So you wanna avoid your bunch grasses and you want to avoid um, high oil producing plants. So you wanna stay away from things like sage and rabbit brush and creosote bush because those are high um, oil producing plants. Even though they're native, you don't want them growing within 30 feet of your structure. Um, so you want low growing, um, ground covers, flocks, um, some of the low growing grasses are okay. Uh, what you don't want is a fuel that's going to build up and create a dry fuel load or have a high oil content that will flames will climb, such as uh, bitter bush or creosote bush, um, where the flames will climb up that and, and you don't want that close to your structure. So there's a lot of native, low growing native plants that you could use. Um, but you want to stay away from your taller bunch grasses and stuff like that. Well, I don't want to see any more online questions. Are there any more questions in the room? We have another question in the room. Okay. Watch out for your bird seed also. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, oh, absolutely. Bird seed too. Yes, there's um, actually been some class A weeds introduced through bird seed. Right. Yes, velvet leaf is, is one of those that was was introduced as well. Um, we believe hound's tongue was introduced in parts of Yakima County through bird feed. Um, but there's there's such little regulation on what goes into wild bird seed. Um, there's there's potential. So make sure if you're feeding birds that you're feeding them in an area that you can kind of regulate where those seeds are dropping and figure out what's growing underneath them. But be aware that birds carry those seeds away as well. Are there any more questions in the room? Are there any more questions online? Got a question down there. Two hands up down here. Oh, sorry. Um, just one thing you mentioned back here about any post trading in literature. There's a lot of good literature here on the side about uh, toxic plants that they're free to take. Yes, we do have the toxicity booklets that Sue had up on the on her first present screen at the back table back there. And we have all kinds of um, information on these tables about plant identification. And um, we do have lots of staff here in the room to ask questions of and on the line. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Rachel.